conference together with Swinburne Adobe Creative Campus. And uh, I am delighted to welcome you back uh, or potentially welcome you if you weren't here for the first day. So uh, uh, just a short reflection before we start properly. Um, I, I think for those of you who were here yesterday, it was a real lovely, buzzy, buzzy feeling. And uh, I had lots of communication with um, people during the conference and, and afterwards as well. And I think the word, the word inspirational was used a lot. And I definitely felt really inspired by, by the conversations, by the presentations. So thank you uh, very much for being with us and sharing it with us. I want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and uh, their elders past, present and emerging who are the traditional owners of the land on which Swinburne's campuses in Australia are located. Also where I am located in, in the city, Melbourne, and I pay my respects. I also encourage you to pay your respect to the uh, Indigenous owners, traditional owners of the land where you are as well. The conference theme is about engaging our hearts and minds through audio. And we've uh, had a number of uh, kind of guiding questions. And what really was uh, amazing yesterday, I think, was that we pulled together a number of, of threads around podcasting being used in teaching and learning and in research. And we heard examples of um, podcasting for engagement as well. For, um, I think, a, a lot of academics uh, using podcasting as a way of being a networked academic. So um, as, as any of us, I think I can kind of use that term us because you're in this room because you're interested in podcasting uh, and and I find that people tend to become very passionate podcast lovers I think as listeners we know that podcasting has this capacity to really bridge uh, a lot of aspects of media experiences and I thought uh, in terms of the conversations yesterday, it was really uh, around things like um, parasocial relationships, how we think of podcast presenters as our friends, how it can really help us make sense of the world uh, and have that experience as a listener. So these, I encourage you to continue to uh, uh, think about these and um, to participate in a broader conversation using the hashtag and a reminder that we are recording this. A lot of people weren't able to participate because they were in different time zones and uh, we will be sharing the conversations uh, with our wider community afterwards. We encourage, of course, microphones to be off if you're not talking, but we like you to talk as well uh, when we have Q&As. And we think of this as a real community uh, and it, which is informed by mutual respect. And uh, we encourage you to, um, to really uh, uh, be constructive and engaged uh, on chats and in conversations. Thank you to Corey Martin, Dylan Bird and Peter Shaw, who are doctoral candidates in podcasting at Swinburne University of Technology, helping us in the chats. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Claire Dyson, who is uh, uh, our Director of Digital Literacy and working with Adobe Creative Campus and Narelle Lemon, who is, who is the Associate Dean Education in the school, who are the three of us have really pulled um, the conference together. Now we have uh, the abstracts and the audio available to listen to. So just a reminder as well, you can go back and do that. So this is today, 
We're starting with a keynote. Uh, we have then two sessions that are looking more at storytelling and the last one, which is about tech talk. So I think you'll find this being really useful for all aspects of doing podcasts. So I'm just going to stay here. So in the keynote, planning for podcasting, dissecting the process, radio scholars and those writing about podcasting, um, but perhaps more radio scholars, uh, have traditionally talked about radio being an invisible or a blind medium. And the way that is described kind of indicates that there's something lacking. But of course, I think you can look at audio-based form as something that is not lacking at all because it's actually really speaking to the listener's imagination. And this idea that missing an image or missing a text makes it somehow uh, inferior is something that I think we saw yesterday and will continue to see today. And the strength of audio storytelling is precisely because we know that audio speaks to listeners' imagination and how voices can create this connection, a strong bond. And as I mentioned, the parasocial relationship um, of being connected, of being in a community. And today we have a real treat. We'll be watching in and listening in to a podcast being made. So this idea that we actually get a sneak, we get to kind of be a fly on the wall, uh, um, on a podcast production in action. And following uh, podcast conventions, there will also be a forensic investigation, interrogation into the practice of making the podcast. So we are going to go a bit meta. Uh, looking at how do you plan for a podcast? And of course, showing that it's not quite as simple as people might think. But it's equally, because it's a magical medium, just as simple so that everyone can use it. And that's one of the great aspects of podcasting. Enough for me. I now invite our keynote speakers. Just going to take Inga, Jason and Narelle. Hi, are we on? Oh, we are, Ingo. I think that's your cue. Yeah. You are <laughs> on. That was me cueing you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, sorry. I didn't get the throw. Um, Narelle, Narelle, maybe you want to um, show the show notes as we talk so we really are um, showing everyone how we make the, on the reg. I can't screen share, but maybe you can. I can do that. Yes. Ooh. Very happy to. Mm. Ooh, exciting times. Okay. Here Hi, everyone. Um. We're so thrilled to be here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to do a show. And then at the end, Narelle is going to talk to us about the show. And she's going to show you the show notes as we do the show. So you can see how we arrange and set out our scripts. And um, we've sort of conceptualised this a bit like a movie director um, talking after a film premiere. So let's just go with it, Jason, because that's what we do. Are you ready, colleague? Okay. All right. <laughs> um, welcome to On The Reg. I'm Inga Mewburn from the Australian National University, but I'm better known as Thesis Whisperer on the internet. I'm here with my good friend, Jason Downs, for another episode of On The Reg, where we talk about work, but you know, not in a boring way. Practical, implementable productivity hacks to help you live a more balanced life. Now, this episode is being recorded as a keynote in the Australian Educational Podcast Conference on the 7th of October, 2021. So we're live from our homes in front of a studio audience, as they say. So how about you introduce yourself, Jason? Hi, I'm uh, Jason Downs and I'm an academic at RMIT, RMIT University in the College of Business and Law and within the School of Management. I've known Inga for over 10 years and last year she convinced, convinced me to start a podcast with her. It was in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, the Australian university sector was melting down and my position as director of programs at the, at the college was about to be made redundant as part of that mess. So, um, of course, I agreed immediately and uh, together we're the co-hosts of On The Reg podcast. So this is a live report recording and um, we have a time limit, Jason. This is hard for us because <laughs> what normally happens is that we have 
we just got, get on the line, don't we? We just chat. And sometimes it goes for two hours and then I have to cut it out. And we'll talk about how I cut and I'll show you <laughs> how I cut later. But um, I now I've set a timer. I've, we've got 42 minutes, so no pressure, Jace. Um, to get through this good. So you'll see how, um, in this case, we'll probably drop some stuff as we go, but hopefully it's fun to watch the script scroll. Um, at the end, our dear colleague, Associate Professor Narelle Lemon from Swinburne, is going to ask us a couple of questions about podcasting. And um, as I said earlier, we're going to see it a bit like a director's talk at the end of a movie premiere. Um, and we'll leave it that last bit on the end of this podcast for our regular listeners who might be interested in how we make the show. So, Jason Downs, now I would say, how have you been since we last caught up? But look, we haven't talked on the reg for about 14 weeks since you've been on hashtag Epic Trip 2021, which is well documented on Instagram, where you went halfway around Australia, roaming the land while the rest of us have been locked in our homes, not at all jealous. <laughs> and you pop in to speak to us on SpeakPipe every now and then, but it's not the same. So, so it's really, really good to have you back. I'm going to have to leave a proper debrief until our next episode or else we will be here for at least the next 42 minutes talking about canyons and jeeps and things. But... Um, <laughs> How, how's it been being back at work this week after three months on the road? Oh, man, I, I was thinking about it the other day. Do, uh, can people visualise the movie poster for um, uh, oh, the movie uh, about uh, leaving Las Vegas? It's, it's the Hunter S. Thompson movie. Um, You're showing your age now, Jace, just so, just so you know. Anyway, it's all kind of warpy, right? There's this picture of this big head and the body's all warpy and it's all out of control. That's how I felt coming back to work today. I was like reinserting myself into the matrix. And it's good to see you again, though. Like, it's been ages and I've missed our banter altogether. Um, we only arrived back in Melbourne on Friday after 14 weeks on the road. We did some 16,000 Ks. And um, while we were tur turtling our way around Australia, we found ourselves in places so far removed from kind of the, the work, the embodiment of work, but also from the idea of work. Um, we found ourselves doing like things that were just the polar opposite of work. So coming back has been a bit jarring. I'm still on holiday time. So there's some advantages to that. I'm waking up before six o'clock in the morning. Normally I'm a much later riser than that. So that's been, that's been really good. Uh, but the most totally satisfying return to work moment was, was when I selected all the accumulated archive, uh, all of the accumulated email, and then I just went control alt archive. And I know, like, I'm actually, I'm so amazed you did whoosh. that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I guess what? Well, well, dude, it didn't end, right? Like, like nothing happened. I was I, like, I, it's so not our normal style because I really thought you'd be in there with some tools and you'd be doing some like amazing sorting and would have had an app that would have shot everything where it needs to go. But no, you just like archived it. That's it. Email, bank oh. email bankruptcy. Amazing. I just like, yeah, yeah, just got rid of the lot. Um, I went in the past, I would have done exactly that. I would have, what's important? Oh my Lord, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, no. Nah. Um, so I, I've had a pretty profound perspective shift while I was away on the trip about work and what that means and how I'm going to deal with it. Um, and that'll probably last until about next week, right? Like, and then I'll be back into it again. <laughs> Uh, but last thing, um, if you d can get the opportunity to take a 14-week trip like that, I was lucky it was long service leave. Um, uh, I thoroughly recommend it. It's really good for your mental health. Uh, it was really good for my mental health anyway. I do feel a bit guilty about all the East Coast lockdown stuff, but guilty, not guilty, hashtag. Sorry, sorry not <laughs> sorry. I could feel it from a distance. Sorry, not yeah. sorry. But, you know, meanwhile, you know, I'm just utterly utterly sick of being at home so it's lockdown week infinity and a half I don't know I was out the other day and I realized I got to that point again where I've forgotten how to wear shoes and I think I've been wearing the same pair of yoga pants all week until my husband looked at them and went are they the same pair of yoga pants I'm like yes like <laughs> maybe so luckily uh these is whisper juniors having his second astra shot on Saturday he's only 19 but he decided he didn't want to wait for um, Pfizer back in the day. So he he bravely, I thought, got a, a shot. So he's taken the second shot. We've been allowed to have people around the house and there's been a lot of, you know, cleaning of the bathrooms also. So, you know, um, I think we've got a couple more weeks stuck at home. I did manage to save my plant from my office and I actually got in trouble because I've been on campus 
And I was like, oh, this is so eerie. It's like the zombie campus. And I was taking photos of it. And then I'm like, here's my plan. I'm saving my plan. Made a whole Insta story. And then my boss said to me, uh, so please don't Insta when you go to campus because everyone started bugging her and the vice chancellor about why weren't they allowed on campus? And why <laughs> Inga allowed to save her plan? And um, I was, yeah, so it was a bit naughty. But uh, I think it will be a slow climb out into anything that resembles living with COVID. What's that? It's going to be a pain in the ass. I can tell that already. You can tell I'm hashtag mood about it. Um, so I'm just going to move us swiftly on to our work problems segment because I'm looking at the clock now. This is a really different way of doing on the reg. I can <laughs> tell you, like, it's cramping my style. So I'm going to try not to look at it. So we're heading now to our work problems segment. Now, um, just what I did then where I kind of stuffed up, I'm just going to say it again because what we do later on in our show is that we use a program called Descript where I can just skip all of this out again so I can just start again and that makes it a very relaxing experience podcasting so I'll start that again. Um, this is our <laughs> work and then you laughed over the top of it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Professionals. Um, this is our work problem segment. In this part of the show, we focus on one aspect of work and we talk about the problems we've encountered. We like to analyse the problems and we also like to talk about the literature. We try to be practical, sharing our tips and hacks for solving the problems. And we take it in turns to do this segment because it's actually quite a lot of work to prepare it. Um, and so this week it's my turn because I thought that was only fair, Jason. I didn't want to really shock you by actually making you do some literature work well, just when you came back from holidays. So I uh, also chatted with Narelle, who's going to talk to us later about, you know, what's a good theme for this keynote? So the thing that we decided to do was when someone comes up to you, and this is mostly an academic thing, but it can be in other workplaces, where someone comes up to you and says, oh, you have to do social media now. You know, we're going to do research impact. You need to become a network scholar. It's going to be really good for your career. You just need to do that. And um, many people, when presented with this, just start to flip out and think, quite rightly, how do I fit into my workload? Um, uh, how do I manage this? What do you mean by social media? Which one? And I guess people ask me about this a lot because I've been thesis whispering since July 2010. So it's over two, 10 years. Um, and I'm a highly visible poster child for academic social media engagement. And it's, of course, really been instrumental in my own career success. So some stats from the blog, because um, I had to do a bit of maintenance the other day and I thought I'd have a bit of a look and it's kind of amazing. So it's had over 10 million visits um, and it's had visits from every country in the world. I thought, except from Greenland, because Greenland looked like it was like the only country that wasn't coloured. And I got really upset, like, what's up, Greenland? Don't you like me, Greenland? What's, what's your problem, Greenland? But it turns out that Greenland routes all its uh, traffic through Denmark. So my Greenland people were actually in Denmark. So every country in the world, um, 35,000 subscribers via email, 50,000 followers on Twitter, plus more than 50,000, $25,000. Uh, $25, I wish it was $25,000. It's not. It's over 25,000 on Facebook and a few thousand in LinkedIn. And this has been a lot of largely invisible work. So that's the work that you do that isn't counted anywhere in a work plan, that doesn't appear in a work allocation. And people really want some short answers for me. You know, how do you replicate that success? How do you still do that and make it as an academic doing scholarly things. Now, I used to teach a three hour workshop for researchers on this, but all I succeeded in doing, Jace, was um, creating fear and uncertainty and doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I teach these workshops, I'd be like, blah, 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 and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then people would just have these sort of deer in the headlight looks. Um, so I changed it into a, a five week course three hours a week so it's 15 hours um, so I in the interest of time I'm not going to rehearse the whole 15 hours of my course I thought I'd look at two problems about social media and what and what it does for academics and we can talk about it and we've got 33 minutes so I'm beginning to think it's probably one problem we'll talk about but the two problems that I'd like to talk about or the problems that I'd like to talk about uh, lack of boundaries between the private and public self and, and the idea of context collapse and the poisonous, addictive, algorithmic social media feeds and the effect that they have on our time and attention. So the idea of context collapse is where information that's intended for one domain 
bleeds or leaks into other domains and it causes problems in how you present yourself or what people think of you. And it's caused by the really easy to share nature of digital information. I think some people forget that email is the most insecure form of communication actually, because anything you attach to an email or say in an email can be sent to anyone else who has an email address. But also when you take photos on your phone or you text, info can leak from one space to another. So a really extreme example of that is revenge porn, right? So where people have taken nudes, sent it to their lover and their lover then puts it on the internet. Um, uh, we've all suffered a little bit of context collapse in this work from home. There's been cats go across. I remember when that BBC presenter had his kid break in um, and it was, it was world news and then your kid just rang past us then during a keynote. So a good example of context collapse in the work from home world. Um, what about your experience of context collapse, Jason? So in the, in the side, in the background, while you gave that excellent introduction to context collapse, Number one son was writing me notes and he's like, he's waving his arms and he's doing all this sort of stuff. I'm like, dang, it doesn't get any, any better than that. <laughs> uh, one of the big ones, I was thinking about this, um, one of the big ones that I had was uh, I have a couple of, like I try and keep my personal life and my professional life pretty separate. So one of the things that people may or may not know about me is that uh, I train for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And when we went into lockdown, uh, my uh, dojo, they put, they started to do virtual classes. And so it's just solo drills and those sorts of things. Um, as an academic, we tend to collect books and like, and I'm in a lot of books, right? And these, <laughs> these books need a place to live. So for us, we've got a, a bookcase that's built into the wall in the lounge room and it kind of takes up the whole wall and all the rest of it. And it's just like it's full of books. Most of the friends who come around or or people who know what I do for a day job come around, they're kind of not surprised by that. But my BJJ crew like, were totally surprised when we're doing kind of Zoom BJJ solo drills. And then in the background is this kind of wall of books. And um, it, you know, it changed the way in which we kind of sort of started to talk to each other at, at BJJ as well, people kind of see you in a different light. That would never have occurred normally uh, because I, I work pretty hard at trying to keep those kinds of aspects of my life apart. The flip side works at work as well, right? Um, my colleagues, I don't talk very much about what I do outside of work uh, to my colleagues and they're often very, very, very surprised to hear about some of the stuff that I get up to. Like, you know, I like to go diving and I've got a Jeep and we've got a tinny and we go fishing and we spend camping for 14 weeks on the top of a Jeep. Like, that's where we lived on top of the Jeep for 14 weeks. Like, people, like, to resolve that in their head sometimes, you get this... <coughs> um, so that's, I guess, that's, that's the big context collapse for me around that kind of professional, personal persona stuff. Yeah, and you got in here that they... they um... They started calling you doctor and you don't go by doctor. And it's funny where you go by doctor and where you don't go by doctor, isn't it? Like yeah. I, I, I don't go by doctor at, um, at the doctor's surgery because I just feel weird. And I remember uh -huh. once my husband filled in some paperwork for me when I had some surgery and he loves the fact that I'm doctor. And so he wrote doctor and then I'm lying on the table and they're literally putting me under and they're all the nurses are hanging shit on the surgeon and going, Oh, look, we've got a real doctor on the table. You're not a real doctor. And anyway, so uh, that, that was quite funny. Um, so of course the problem of context collapse um, really started with this one of my favorite sociologists, Irvin Goffman. Goffman was amazing. He used to do things like, hang out in asylums, in restaurants, in all sorts of places and just write down what was happening. And he observed people going about their everyday life. And he, he had this what's called a dramatological theory where he, he said that all social life really was composed of acting, that we play roles. And we play multiple roles in, in different spaces, um, help us play different roles. So the famous example he uses is restaurant waiters. So he did write this book in 1965, so I don't know if that's why, um, why this example sounds like it does, but he says, if you sit in a restaurant, the waiters out the front will be really deferential, they'll be charming, they'll be attentive, they'll be polite, and in the kitchen, they'll be shouting and throwing things at the chef. Now, I, I don't know if new workplace rules really allow waiters to be that, um, but maybe, I don't know, what's that, that um, bloody celebrity chef, Gordon Ramsay? They're probably shouting in his kitchen, but maybe not others. But he said... 
Um, what's really interesting in a restaurant is if you sit by the swinging door that leads into the kitchen, um, what you see is a way to transition or have that sort of liminal space or cross that boundary but between playing one role and another. So um, from deferential to aggressive, and you can see the change by sitting at the front at the swinging door. So in my course, we talk about the swinging door problem of social media. Um, but I'm interested in what you think of that idea of social life as kind of being an actor. Yeah, it can be tricky, right? Like, um, because you can use social media to kind of build a persona um, if you want to, or reinforce a projected identity. Um, but if it's a false one, I reckon that's when social media becomes exhausting to do. So in the idea here with the work problem where the university has asked you to do this, one of the early steps, I think, is to kind of decide how it is that you're going to go about doing that. So um, for me, I think that the way in which I like to do it is to be on, uh, authentic around kind of what I post and, and I would like to I like to think that if people were to meet me in real life, that they would not be surprised if they met me kind of in front of house or in the kitchen, if you know what I mean. But. Yeah, so you're kind of making an amalgam or a blend of both your public and private self on social media. And I think you're right. When people, I talk to people about how fatiguing it is to just, uh, for most people to just play one role on social media, that you better to sort of bring in those elements of yourself and turn up and turn down um, different aspects, if you like. So one way to do this is to, um, to use the space and to imagine the space, the social media space in a particular way. So for example, um, my Twitter feed's really large, like I've got a very big following and it grows all the time. So clearly I'm doing something there that people like. And I've always imagined, well, maybe not always, I started in Twitter about 2009, but probably from about 2010, when I started Thesis Whisperer, um, the Twitter's been the kind of companion channel for Thesis Whisperer. So I think about, about it like a radio station. So Thesis Whisperer on Twitter is like easy listening for PhD students, early career researcher. So I think, what would they want to listen to? What link would they want? They'd want useful practical things on writing, for instance. So I do retweet a lot of that. I actively search it out. They'd want to know about jobs that are coming up. Um, occasionally, I play something a bit more challenging. So if you're thinking about the music analogy as a DJ, and I know you've been a DJ, so you're probably going to have some comments on this. Like huh. Mostly you give them something to dance to. Occasionally, you challenge them. You can forward announce and back announce um, the tweet, so you put a bit of yourself and your personality into the tweets. Um, but I thought this would be a good um, chance to say, so if you're sort of curating a social media feed in this way, um, there's some really good tools for that that you taught me actually, Jason. So um, do you wanna, so you don't there all the time. You can sort of create a role there, but you don't have to be playing it the whole time. Yeah, have one of the- Auto, you know. Yeah, exactly. One of the beautiful things about, uh, uh, computers and and social media is that the people are building automating automating processes around all of this sort of stuff and if you, you if you start to think about this as how can I hook different services together um, it makes the actual process of running a social media account actually really easy so I want to talk about three I want to talk about pocket buffer and if this then that so Pocket is a little uh, browser extension that hangs out on your browser and as you're you know, browsing through the internet and you come across stuff that you're interested in, you can hit save in pocket and it saves it as in a virtual library um, with a link and all the rest of it. And it gives you the opportunity to use things like hashtags as well to be able to classify. So, that, and that's how I do it. So if I'm reading something on strategy, for example, and maybe it's strategy is practice, I'll use the hashtag SAP. And so later when I come back to my pocket library, I just do a search on the hashtag SAP and all the stuff that comes up around strategies practice is there with links associated with it. And then I can go through the process of kind of retreating or retweeting or commenting on that. To be able to do that, I, I treat social media like a, like a job. So there's a great tool called Buffer. You can get a free account um, where what you can do is you can pre-schedule tweets to go out live um, or to go out at a, at a predetermined time. So... For the Oz Ed PodCon people who are uh, online now, if you go and have a look at my at Jason Downs Twitter account, you'll see that there's a, since about one o'clock, there's been a few tweets have kind of popped up. Um, I didn't, I haven't been doing that while I've been here. I've actually, I wrote them last night, right? And so they've been, been just kind of automatically sending out while we're in the middle of this. So if I've got my timing right, there should be like a cheeky one there at 
at Thesis Whisperer, like teasing her about whether or not she's being distracted by all of the mentions of it. I'm putting in as it goes along. I'm trying to distract her from being professional. Uh, the last one is If This Then That. Um, it's a service that hooks different digital services together. So the advantage of this is if uh, you're charged with writing some content for the university uh, to get more further public engagement, uh, let's say you write a blog post, you post it to the university, whatever space, you can use if this then that to take that newly published post, automatically put a link to it in a new tweet, append some pre-written text that you've got to it, and then send it off. So all you have to do is write the blog post and then the, the robots do all the rest. It, there are ways of um, being able to find these services, connect them together, and all of those services, Pocket, Buffer, and If This Then That, um, all have free accounts. Um, I don't think, I, oh, for a while there when I was like hardcore, I paid for the Buffer one, but um, I've moved back to the free accounts and it just does the job perfectly for me. I still pay for Buffer just because, you know, I've got a bit more of a social media empire. But I noticed <laughs> that if, if then the, this and that has moved to a paid model and I've actually cancelled my subscri subscription because I don't think I was making best use of it. So the good thing about these, though, is you can sort of spin them up and spin them down. And we're always on the hunt, aren't we, Jason, for, oh, yeah. and share them with each other. And so I remember you shared me that whole workflow with me. You came to... Canberra after you'd finished your PhD and you came you just hung out and we um and then you sat on the couch with me and you're like Inga Inga I have to show you this and I got really impatient I like it took ages to set it up from memory <laughs> um but I've used it ever since I've never revisited how I set it all up it's just is um is a detailed workflow and it's so helpful so um so coming back to this idea of Twitter as a DJ space um as I said you can forward announce and back announce so when you're sharing a link it's a really good idea to say something to the audience about it even if it's just a head exploding emoji um and that, <laughs> so that you know you can just straight retweet things and I do that a lot especially if I'm just scrolling through and um, in a hurry but I, I also like to really compose tweets especially for when I'm promoting the work of other people and I always try and promote more that other people's work than my own so I try to keep the balance um, where I'm not just shouting about myself all the time but this also helps me think about what not to tweet and share and this can be really hard because social media is really built to promote the outrage machine um, mm. and I'm I've got really a strong views strong views Jason about things like climate especially so what I try and do is go well I'm going to feel this way about climate um, everything that the government does about climate irritates me. But what I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to talk about um, university super funds investing in fossil fuels. So I keep my climate comments and try to keep them focused on how it affects higher ed. So that's how I mm. sort of shape it. But what about your Twitter persona, Jason? Yeah, I've got some, some pretty simple rules, really. Uh, the first one is like, be cool right? Like kind of Fonzie, right? From happy days. So showing my age. Um, don't post, I don't like, don't post stuff that's likely to end up in a flame war. You know, that's not going to help anybody and you can't win a flame war. You just end up kind of, everything gets burnt and horrible. And so I just, I just don't go there to start with. Uh, don't post stuff that's going to get me fired, right? Like I still need still need the income to be able to like do good work, right? So um, that's a rule. Um, and then I just keep to a few main tropes, right? Productivity stuff, killer robot dogs, text expander. You know, we wrote a book about text expander, hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? Uh, online privacy slash algorithmic work. Uh, that's starting to kind of come through now. I'm sort of developed a bit more of an interest around that. Um, and most recently, my Bujo uh, habit, <laughs> yeah, it is and, a habit. And and slash your, addiction. Your, your stencil habit. I mm -hmm. oh, no, just just bought a whole bunch more <laughs> stencils. <laughs> no, um, but if people follow me, they they pretty much know what they're going to get. I don't stray too far from these topics. Yeah, so it's interesting. I think the the chief difference between us is that I've thought about an audience that I want to service, which is PhD students, early career researchers. Whereas you're shaping yours around what interests you, and if other people are interested in that, well, great. So I think there's like many different approaches you can take. So um, with the editorial hat on, because I'm driving the bus for this episode, um, Jason, and part, important part of podcasting when you're 
get deep in a conversation, it's good to have someone who's just in charge of steering it. It means that you don't negotiate it along on the way through. So one of us always drives the bus and I'm driving the bus. It's a position of power. As my therapist says, you don't like sitting at the back of the bus, do you, Inga? So I love to drive the bus. And I'm driving us around this whole next section. So I'm just going to scroll it, past. Even when I'm supposed to be driving, driving the even when I'm I supposed to be driving the, the bus. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's okay, like, oh, I'm no longer it. driving the bus. <laughs> All right. So we're going to move on to our reading section. Section Now, this has actually become intensely competitive. I think we should rename our reading section hashtag competitive reading, Jason, because um, uh, while, you, while you're away, friend, I didn't read a single book. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, I read, I read fiction a lot. books. I know. But I was like, Jason's not here. There's not, like no incentive to, no one to beat. So, you know, uh, it's sad. <laughs> It's sad, but I'm at least I'm owning it. So in this section, we just talk about what we've been reading, what's interesting or unusual about it. Um, and I have been dying to talk to you about this article, Jason. In fact, I saved it in my pocket with a special hashtag Jason. I've got Ooh. Jason in my pocket thing. So I was like, oh. oh. But then when I went to the hashtag, I had like 20 things. But I do remember this <laughs> my favourite. So this article was on the, on, uh, the site called The Verge. And the, the article is actually called File Not Found. And actually, when um, when I went into Pocket and I found it, it's the, the verge, and then <laughs> File Not Found, I'm like, oh, damn it, um, it's Link Pride or something. And they're like, oh, no, 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 that's just the name of the article. So it's an article, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but it's about computer science teachers, and they're really struggling to teach Zoomers. And Zoomers are kid, uh, um, people kind of my kid's age and a little bit older, so they're early to mid-20s. They were born around the turn of the century. Um, and computer science teachers are really struggling with these people because as they've worked out, they've got a very profoundly different conception of the internal space of their um, computers and how they work. So the article starts with Catherine Garland, who's an astrophysicist, and she noticed the problem really starting in 2017. So um, kids born in like um, 1999 or 2000. And she was teaching an engineering course and the students were using simulation software um, that asked, you know, to load a file, I'm guessing. And quoting from the article here, she said, it says, she'd laid out the assignment clearly, but student after student was calling her for help. They were all getting the same error. I mean, they were all getting, they were all getting the same error message. The program couldn't find their files. Garland thought it would be an easy fix. She asked each student where they'd save their project. Could they be on the desktop? Perhaps in the share drive. But over and over, she was met with confusion. What are you talking about? Multiple students inquired. Not only did they not know where their files were saved, they didn't even understand the question. Gradually, Garland came to the same realisation that many of her fellow educators have reached in the last four years. The concept of file folders and directors, directories, essential to previous generations understanding of computers is gibberish to many modern students. Now, this made sense to me because I've been arguing with Thesis Whisperer Junior now for well over 10 years, I say, where's that file? Uh, you know, when he, oh, when he wants homework help, I'm like, well, you know, get the file up. And then he can't find the file. I'm like, can you just file the file properly? He goes, what do you mean file the file? I'm like, put the file in the file, file you know. And then I realised <laughs> actually he doesn't understand the internal computer the way that I do. So I've got a mental model of a computer as a filing cabinet that's got drives and drawers and directories and kind of hanging folders that, you know, that are the folders. Whereas the Gen Z or the Zoomers, they think about their computers as a laundry basket mm -hmm. where they just search to find what they want. And this made so much sense to me. And But for computer science teachers, it's actually a really big problem because code often needs to call in or draw information from files that are put in a specific location. So you have to tell the computer, look for file in directory X, extract whatever and return it back in, then the code keeps working. So now they've had to actually build in new courses, um, primary courses for their students to help them imagine the interior of their computers differently. And I actually find that it's really hard to teach these courses because it's such a huge mental model switch. So I realised that I've kind of gone a bit laundry basket, um, but I'm wondering, are you laundry basket or far folders, Jason? No, I mean, I am you know, timber library catalog shelf with little drawers and like little labels on the front, Dewey Decimal System. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, uh, in the context of 
you know, this is the way knowledge has been organized over time, right? Like this is the scientific way in which we organize knowledge. We've got categories and classifications and we kind of, we work our way down, right? You're either an animal or you're a mineral or like whatever, right? And we, we work our way down. Um, and that has served us really, really, really well. But on the other hand, if you're using this kind of laundry basket method where you can just pick anything and it's not within the same classification, the way in which the relationships between the, the uh, pieces of information changes. So I wondered as a result of, of thinking about this, I wondered whether or not the Zoomers might be better at making unexpected or novel create, creative links between pieces of information in the way that maybe I wouldn't be able to do. So the example that I was thinking about was um, maybe I want to start with protein. I go from protein to meat. I go from meat to ham. I go from, you know, and I'm like, I'm kind of thinking my way down that. It's unlikely that I'm going to pair up ham and pineapple because it's a different class. Unless you want right? it on a pizza. You want it on a pizza, though. Like if of you're course Australian I do. Pineapple. You're the best <laughs> podcast ho- like partner in the world, right? Like handball. Here it is. <laughs> good job but that's exactly right right like if you were going to go work your way down the 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 file structure you probably wouldn't get to ham plus pineapple but mm. if if you're if you're doing it like i wonder what ham plus pineapple would taste like mm. gold mm. by the way um, <laughs> <laughs> um i wonder whether or not the zoomers will have a different perspective around that and whether or not we might see this kind of burst of creativity don't i yeah i don't like I really think one thing that I've realized since I read this article I'm like right I am falling into a laundry basket thing especially in my Google directories like they're a mess and I think they facilitate being a mess and being on a Mac facilitates being in a mess because spotlight is so powerful so I was actually listening to the Asian productivity show Mm. Yeah, and they they had some really good suggestions on file naming and they said like just call your files what they actually are like as descriptive as you can. And I've started doing that and I found it's really increased my uh, chances of retrieval because I'll type a few words and it kind of is that and it does generally find it. So those quite descriptive file names um, rather than shorthand file names, which I've always, I've got as a habit from when file names could only be, you know, I can't remember, eight or 16 characters long, remember? Yeah. And they yeah, couldn't yeah. have special characters and everything. So we're getting old, Jason, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, but what have, what have you been reading? Because we have now, just, you know, not to stress you out, 11 minutes, go. Yeah, done. Um, I've read a lot while I was away, a lot of books. And uh, the one I wanted to talk about today was one called um, Hyperfocus. And it's got the subtitle, How to Work Less and Achieve More, which mm. I'm just here to say is effectively crack cocaine for someone like me. Right? Oh, totally. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> totally. You, you didn't buy it in an airport, did you? Because we haven't been in airports. That's been the problem, Jason. We haven't, like, we'd have more of these books if airports were still a thing in our lives. Oh, but, no, but do you know what? News mm. agents are the new airport bookstores. Mm. That's where you get these books, right? Like they, because they, all they want is the top list of the category in in Amazon or whatever, and then they they stock a few, right? That's where you go, news agents. Oh. Um, anyway, turns out great book. So I'd not come across Chris Bailey's work before. Apparently, he's like world famous and has sold millions of copies of something called the Productivity Project and blah 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 blah. How I missed that, I don't know. Anyway. He's done some serious research on this topic of hyperfocus, and the main premise of the book is that uh, you can train, develop what he calls your attentional space. So he's gone off and he's spoken to a lot of experts. He's clearly done a lot of research here. Uh, the back of his book is absolutely just jam packed full of references. I don't like the what the referencing system. Give me Harvard any day, but. Uh, but it's just like, it's just jam packed, right? Like this is a serious piece of work, but it's written in this really accessible kind of way. Uh, it's written for airport bookstores. Um, he, he covers everything from the neuroscience of, uh, of focus, um, how to manage your environment, your physical environment to reduce distractions, how to build your match fitness for maintainers, maintaining focus. Um, the big hint here uh, is that meditation works as a precursor to being able to focus he's saying crap that, meditator i'm so uh, crap so 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 crap 
Exactly. Yeah. Well, he gives a like he he gives us a little example of how you can go about doing that in kind of your everyday practice. And uh, we'll come back to this in our two minute tips. Um, the book was full of these really interesting stats. Uh, unfortunately, I took the book away with me and now I've squirreled it away in the bottom of the Jeep somewhere and I couldn't find it before <laughs> we started today. But there were stats like, you know, if you, multi if you multitask, you, then you lose uh, your, pro your productivity drops by insert really outrageous number like 67% mm. or 84% or 38% or something. Um, and it was just full of these kinds of stat uh, these stats that were backed by science. And I was reading through them as I'm reading through them. Oh, I do that. Oh, I'm working against myself here. <laughs> you know, like there was, yeah. there was a lot of it. Um, he argues that there are two main modes of operating. Uh, there's hyper-focus, which is what you would kind of think of as that deliberate practice, that kind of focusing on one particular thing and only focusing on that one particular thing to execute. And then the other side of that coin is scatter focus, where he talks about the... Uh, the brain being able to take in all of these kinds of data points, uh, but you need to be able to provide it with some space to be able to make the connections between those mm. various data points. Uh, and it was a it was a, it was a really really good book. Uh, one of the key takeaways I've got for this uh, was um, w was that he said pay attention to how often your attention wanders and how long it takes to wander, and. I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I can do that. Like, I've got pretty good attention. Like, pretty good attention, like 19 seconds, 24 seconds, you know, like, mm. and then I'm like, oh, look, bright, shiny thing. <laughs> you know, like, um, so I, that for me was like, that was a, it was a big insight for me in, in terms of my own ability to be able to hold my attention on a particular thing. Good book. I recommend it. I give it four and a half attentional area focus enlargement stars. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I did buy it and I haven't focused enough to read it. <laughs> but, but I shall, but I shall. Um, let's move on because we I think we're going to land this one like a double backwards flip off a high board on our toes like I'm feeling it for us. I'd back us. We have six <laughs> minutes, 37 seconds. Um, so this is our two-minute tips section. And this section we've named in honour of, of the great David Allen and his Getting Things Done books. Um, David Allen argues that if a task David, if a task tastes less <laughs> snippity do that. Uh, snippity do that. Uh, if a task takes takes no, if you, if a task takes <laughs> less than two minutes to complete, you should do it then and there. Um, it will take more than two minutes to capture the task in your system. Schedule time to do it, mark it as complete. But really, we call it two-minute tips, but we're just here for quick and dirty hacks, basically things that get us through the days um, at work. So uh, I've got a two-minute tip, which came out of a book that I've had for ages, and I just signed up for a new productivity um, mailing list called Compassionate Productivity. Jason, mm. you may want to link put the link in the... Um, chat for our for our watches excellent i'll see what i can handy. do um so uh it's a it's a new list started by a person whose name i can't remember so i should have put it in the show notes properly but anyway i, I opened Gr this stephen griffiths stephen griffiths thank you stephen in the one of the first emails he sent um from the list it's got this big google list of um oh, i've got someone there who should, isn't on you sorry can you mute um, Narelle? Thank you. Um, yeah, so he sent this big sort of Google spreadsheet and it's got all these sort of books on it. I'm like, oh, that book looks really good. It's called How to Take Better Notes. And I thought that's the kind of book I would want to have. And I went to my Kindle and it's like, oh, you've had that book for three years, Inga, actually. <laughs> and um, and it's by Sonka Ahrens. I think that's how you say her name. Um and it's about an old German um, note-taking book called the uh, note-taking method called the slip box. And the idea is to connect notes through a, a, a numbering system. And um, it's a really interesting idea. But when I saw that it was about, you just write the note basically exactly, you know, in kind of pre-formatted language, like you're writing it in a paper or a book, which I've done for years actually, is write your notes sort of as little snippets or chunks of um, sort of copy ready text 
Um, but the, the trick with this system is to sort of number them and then connect them through numbering system. And then I realized where else to have a numbering system, uh, Jason, in my Bujo, my bullet journal. Mm. So I've started just a new type of collection in my bullet journal called thoughts. And whenever I have a thought, I just put it on a page and it ends up in the index. And now I've got a meta index of my thought. Anyway, I will report back. But so far, it's been, it's given me a bit of freedom to just sort of think through ideas um, on the on the page. So anyway, that's my two minute tips tip wow. for today. But but um I it's probably not a very good one because I need to like report back. But the, if the only bit of this two minute tip that you got was that you should subscribe to compassionate productivity, then my work here is done. Okay, Jason, your two minute tip, and you've got three minutes and 19 seconds to do it. Perfect. This one comes out of um pretty much straight out of the focus uh, hyper focus book which um for me i just wanted to report back that since i've been trying to just bring my attention back like so this is a practice more than a hack right like normally we like we find a piece of tech or something to help us along um but this has been this process of me just trying to bring my attention back to the task that i've got at hand has made a huge difference it's been really good it's a piece of advice from that book um, I'm, I back it all, all the way. Uh, one of the quotes that uh, it's a it's a form of meditation. Like you don't have to sit there and kind of um. You don't have to be like that, right? Like just bring your bring your attention back to the thing that you're paying attention to. And um, and it like it's been it's been working for me. But early days, right? It's just been working for me. Early days in the matrix, Jason. Um, <laughs> That's it. Uh, so um, so we did it. I think we did the shortest on the reg ever. Uh, thanks for listening. We love reviews, don't we, Jason? We do. We love them so much. Um, we'd love it if you'd leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, we read every single one. We use them to shape the show. Or you can tell a friend. Like I listened to these people talk. It wasn't all crap. That, <laughs> that would be good. Um, you can join us um, by voice if you want to ask us a question. Not many people do, but we always love it when they do leave us a message on SpeakPipe and we'll mm -hmm. include the link to SpeakPipe in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Where can people find you on the internet, Jason? Uh, you can find me at Jason Downs on Twitter. That's the best spot. Brilliant. And I'm at Thesis Whisperer on Twitter. And thank you for listening, uh, live audience and uh, non-live audience, well, not that you're not alive, um, uh, <laughs> to, to this very quick on the reg. I think we did a decent job of that, Jason. Um, we're go now going to go into our 20 minutes of conversation with Narel, who's going to join us on the virtual stage, I'm guessing, um, as a big person. Hello, Narel. Um, so there you go. That was us. And I hope it was fun reading along on the show notes and seeing how we kind of mix it up as we go. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I hope I followed, you know, as we, you could see the complications of the script in terms of how detailed they are and then moving through and, and then following how um, conversation is also spontaneous as well. So in this aspect of our, our keynote and this session is that in conversation and we want to have a look at the planning and have dissect what you do and have a look at also different elements that go towards putting the episode together. So you you've shown us so much by being very generous that we could screen share the script. Um, and so those here today are a mix of newbies, I'm not podcasting yet, but I really want to, many who started podcasting in COVID times, putting my hand up to be one of them. And we've been learning skills as we go along. Google has been our best friend. Um, we often um, are nerds on podcasting and share tips between ourselves on texting and those sorts of aspects. Um, so we're, a, you know, an audience of all sorts of different uh, expertise here. So one of the things that stands out to me is on the reg is a team podcast. It's the two of you. It's quite obvious that it is very much a team. Inga drives the bus, but that <laughs> swaps. <laughs> Sometimes. Kind of swaps. <laughs> <laughs> I really love to know how you approach in terms of your content and deciding, you know, what are you going to do? What's this going to look like? How does this, how does this work? Do you want to start, James? Yep. Okay, sure. Um, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, the opening gambit of our episodes is 
is really just usually Inga and I just bullshitting on about what we've done over the last week since the last time we've recorded or the last couple of weeks since we recorded the last episode. And that's the joke in the title on the reg. Like we used to do this ad hoc. We'd ring each other on the phone and just like vent and talk and stuff. And that would be whenever, usually if one of us was coming home from work or something like that. Anyway, um, the, it's turned out that we now have a schedule and we've, we've evolved this. We record every two weeks and release every three weeks. And that way we kind of, we, we get a couple up um, along the way. Um, and, but they, usually there's been something kind of interesting happening either at work where the, it's done something kind of <clears throat> interesting <laughs> you know <laughs> like um or we've been out doing things and because we're interested in the world right like we notice things and then we, we, we've just got stuff to talk about it helps that Inga and I have known each other for I think it's 13 years now um and we know each other really well as well so our families know each other and 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 so we're good friends and Inga's a very generous co-host in and conversationalist as as you can see so she, she picks up the other end of the rope when I throw it sometimes which is very helpful also I'm a control freak so you'll see that <laughs> I I've marked in and often when I do these scripts I'll put in a comment or a like Jason you can talk here and of course the implication being that you're not allowed to talk at any other time but he does and it's okay I mean so it's um, I love the start of our podcast um, and um, a lot of people, when they tell, tell other people about the podcast, they go, I'll just skip the bit at the front. They just kind of crap on. And then other people say, oh, it's the best bit of the show. It's so amazing. And some people, I've looked at our stats on Apple Podcasts and there's a significant amount of the audience to just listen for the first half an hour and then turn it off. Which oh, really? Us, yeah, which to us is amazing because, you know, they just want to hear about the Tesla and the Jeep and the <laughs> whining. Uh, I dislocated my toe. There was the spider rain. Remember that? <sighs> and then, you know, you your kind of series of interesting report backs from lockdown, the Melbourne's longest lockdown. Um, so <laughs> I think people have developed a relationship with our friendship, which mm. is kind of nice because we've, we've enjoyed our friendship for a really long time. And mm. um, it's sort of just nice to, I don't know, maybe we're both showboats, Jason, or something. Yeah, yeah. The other thing Possibly. is that it's 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 evolved a little bit as well over the, mm. over time, and and so there are there are conversations in the background. We do text each other and and sometimes by Twitter and sometimes there's a phone call. There's been a couple of phone calls where I've said, you know, I really wanted to cover this particular topic, and um, Inga's talked me down from the cliff face uh, because maybe hashtag career limiting move. Mm. Uh, so we've. Um, there is that kind of background stuff that goes on as well. There's, uh, it, we don't have meetings. We don't like Tuesday, 10 o'clock, let's plan. We did. We had one meeting, but remember, we didn't get through any of our agenda. We just didn't. Have <laughs> I was like, right, Jason, we're having a meeting now. There's an agenda. We need to talk about you going away because, you know, control free. And um, we didn't end up talking about it at all. I just did whatever I want for 13 yep. weeks and it was fine. Hey, was remember good. when you started, Jason, I made you listen to a particular podcast series, which you probably wouldn't have listened to. What was it? Uh, chat 10 looks three, which is now like permanently pinned to the top of my podcast list. Thanks very much. Annabelle Crab, Lee <laughs> Sales. Uh, great podcast. And I said, I want to do chat 10 looks three for academia. So yeah. that was kind of like creative borrowing. <laughs> no, no, stealing. we reference. We yeah. reference. Yeah, That's we right. reference. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> mm. Anyway, we should let Narelle back in to ask a question, mm. do we? I don't know where we are on this bit anymore. Narelle. <laughs> yes, <We're>... hello. <laughs> and I've actually lost video at this stage, so I can't actually oh, no. see anyone or anything. I've just got this black screen in front of me, so I'm not sure what's happening. So I'm very much going by audio and, and sound and the fact that we have a, have a script. Um, I'm interested to know about um, the flow. So we often, we had an in-conversation um, pre-event to this, this podcast conference that kind of talked about podcasting episodes as having cadences and critical points and there was patterns with flow. Um, and we know that that really helps with uh, audience engagement. And you've kind of referred to that in a way with chat 10, book three, it has a really strong flow and pattern. And so I'm wondering, you know, what does, how do you do that and approach that for on the reg? Um, so the segments really help us, I think. And um, 
So I've always really thought about who's listening, what are they wanting to get out of it? Um, what's the listening experience of this? If you're in on our friendship, um, how, do, how do we structure that? Which is why we've got the catch up bit at the start and then the work problems and then the reading and then the, so that we've always got the same segment. So I think I've noticed this with Thesis Whisperer too, that consistency is really key in building an audience. People like to know what to expect. Mm. So the, the, when they open a Thesis Whisperer blog, they know it'll be friendly, that it'll be informative, that I won't just tell you about a problem, I'll try and tell you how to solve it. Um, and so, so with On The Reg, we know when you get there, it's friendly, it's informative, noticing a pattern here, but um, <laughs> e editing is a big part of it. You've got a bit up here, Jason, um, where you talk about me leaving things on the cutting room floor, because you experience the editing differently to me, because I see it all, I edit it all. Um, but you just you just have the experience of recording it and then listen to it. And, mm. you know, sometimes I take out half an hour. Mm. Um, so, yeah. In yeah. Inga likes to refer to my particular style as musings, <laughs> and <laughs> much of which ends up on the, on the editing cutting room floor. And um, it can... And because they come out so long after we record them sometimes, um, when you listen back to them, it's like, hang on, didn't we talk about this kind of thing? And um, Inga, uh, she's an excellent editor and she uses, uh, she might talk about, um, Inga might talk about some of the tools that we use uh, to do that. But when she edits, she keeps it really, really tight in terms of what we're doing. We can, we can talk about other um we we can bring some stuff back later if we want to it's like it's never gone it's just not in that episode yeah and we are we do have very different takes on things as well I think that helps with flow as as well I mean I'm I'm quite a fan of Cal Newport's podcast but I really feel like I have to be in the mood because it's so Cal like it's mm. just Cal I don't know how he even does that he just talks at you um, I don't know how much editing he must do, but he just talks at you for an hour. And I'm like, wow. And I really like the fact that ours is, we're two different voices and I think that gives it variety and texture. What do you reckon, Jase? Yeah, I, I like to think of you as the smart one, right? <laughs> like, and I like to just tinker. <laughs> so, um, and we come at it from different ends and uh, very much that's experience and discipline and all that sort of stuff feeding into that a little bit. And, mm. and there's been examples where we've talked about, uh, you, you in particular, you talked about having to, you have, you have to deliver an architectural drawing at a particular time you can't freeze on this thing you have to have creativity and mm. when I come at it from a business discipline perspective we have a different side but we often meet in the middle and um, mm. it gives a richer shape to some of our conversations I think mm. if you could see us in a row, we're looking at you expectantly ah yes <laughs> thank Q, you Q Narelle. Q <laughs> thank you thank you I literally am looking at a black screen so I don't know what Zoom is doing to me but um you're, you're yes, still you're, here that's the important thing that and you're very thing. zen princess of calm about that like yeah, I'm yeah. like tearing my hair out <laughs> well I'm 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 learning to I, I think I had my hissy fit and like drama drama and went all red before we started when um we were had everyone in the waiting room and we were trying to figure out what was going on with the thing so I think I've like I've got it all out and now I'm like okay just give it to me Zoom <laughs> what magic are you going to give me now <laughs> You know, um, I don't even know if we're still recording, so I'm hoping we are, all those sorts of things. So um, but some lovely people have been direct messaging saying, yes, we can still see you. So I'm like, more than one person's done that, so I'm like, <laughs> okay, this is good. Thank you, friends. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, planning is not just about the podcast itself. So each episode is scripted. We've know, we know that we've had a wonderful, generous insight into that. I wanted to talk about the time that is involved because many people have said to me when I first started podcasting, oh, cool, I'll do that too. And I'm like, great. And then they come back to me maybe a week later and go, oh, wow, this is <laughs> a bit more complex than I thought. Can you just give me the answer? And it's like, yeah, not really. <laughs> so for those um, beginning out, what do we tell us about this? Well, so I think it's important first to talk about the tools that can save you time. 
Yeah. So we started off, didn't we, Jason? Remember, we aborted so many missions trying to record in Zoom. Yeah. Which we're doing, <laughs> doing today. <laughs> And I just, I hate Zoom for podcasting. It gives you poor quality audio. Just the control over where the audio sits, if it sits in the cloud, bringing it down, I just find it's really unreliable. And there's syncing problems sometimes too, where voices don't actually match. So I, I'm as <clears throat> a little bit of a control freak perfectionist. So I went on a hunt, you know. So I looked at the squad cast. We were in Zencaster for a long time. Um, and we've re I've recently moved to Riverside, Riverside is a great platform because it down it records onto everyone's separate hard drives and then it puts it up and you can you can mix or you can pull them down separately as separate files. Um, and uh, you can see each other and you can also actually broadcast it out on YouTube or other things. So we could have done this in Riverside today if we wanted to, but we decided with Zoom because, you know, it's not, <laughs> let's not rock the boat. So I think it starts with where you record um, and how you get your, um, get your audio. So if you can afford Riverside, I highly recommend it. It's about $9 a month. And one of the reasons that Jason and I, for instance, did the book on Text Expander was that we pay already about 200 odd a year for hosting, you know, even the microphones, everything costs money, right? So, um, so finding ways that you can promote and sell things to offset the cost is, is kind of the serious hobby that doesn't cost you anything, but otherwise it's going to cost you. So Zencaster, it, you can do pretty good things for free and quite cheap in Zencaster. Riverside's more expensive, but it is slightly better. I then have started to use Adobe Audition. I'm so excited to come to the workshop I'm, that's happening after this, <laughs> this keynote because um, that's so powerful. It's got some really um, great tools for filtering out things like background noise. Um, having good mics, I just bought a, I haven't shown um, Jason yet, my new mic. I nice. know. Oh, Sweet. Sweet. Uh, <laughs> um, still waiting for my cover to come, Dick Smith. Don't like, don't even talk to me, Dick Smith. Okay. Um, so, and then I, um, one of the programs I really rely on is called Descript, D E Script. Um, and what that does is you load the audio in, it produces a transcript using AI, which has some very amusing translation problems. Um, uh, and then you can edit the audio like it's a text file. And I think for me, as originally a blogger, that's a very natural thing for me to do to look at a flow of text. The other thing that's really great about Descript is it finds automatically finds filler words like, you know, um, uh, like, and it'll highlight those. And sometimes I'll remove more, well over 100 uh, from our scripts. And that just, um, I think, as a listening experience in your ears, um, just makes it sound a lot smoother. Um, so I think all those things, and then I use GarageBand as well for composing. So I think if you've got, if you can throw some money, not a lot, but a little bit of an investment in some of these good tools, you can make that process really fast. I, I wouldn't even be podcasting if it wasn't for Descript. I just wouldn't have the patience for listening and doing time codes. And I used to do radio back in the day, and I remember actually cutting tape and stuff. It's really quite an intricate process. So that's uh, save you a lot of time. But there's also just writing the show notes. So, Jason, you did that huge deep dive on procrastination. Remember, you wrote these show notes. I think we've got about 200 pages of show notes actually at just, you know, like these show notes, um, but in yeah. smaller types, so even longer. Um, and you did, you did all that reading into procrastination. Remember we started off and we're like, oh, this will be an episode. And then we're like, actually it's three. Um, yeah. How long, how long did that take you? But you did a double dip there. So you're preparing for a keynote and yep. then you, yeah. You want to talk yes. about that a bit? Um, so, uh, like academics, right? Like you can you can just keep going for as long as you like around a particular topic. Um, I like to, uh, as Inga was saying before, I like to kind of have in mind what would be useful. We talk about on the reg being practical, implementable productivity hacks. So, my the the people that I'm thinking about are business people who might be listening to this. So this is a different audience to who Inga's probably got front of mind and how they might be able to find some of these things useful that we can bring from the literature or from the university work context and, and help other people. So, um, so that took quite a long time. I used, uh, I used a, a range of a mind mapping software called iThoughtsX. Um, I dragged all of my notes into iThoughtsX, Ex Ordered that to Word 
has a big long list of stuff with comments and all that sort of stuff, and then exported that into our show notes. Um, one of the other pieces of technology uh, that we use is Text Expander. We have a Text Expander snippet that is the structure of each uh, episode. So I'll fire that off, set, op open up the structure. So it says, you know, it's got headings and all this sort of stuff and kind of leading statements about what each section is going to be. So we don't have to write that every time and we and we get the same flow every time. And then Inga and I go in and we kind of add in our bits and pieces from there. Hmm. We're looking yeah, at you expectantly. I was about to say, ex I, we need to expect it. Expected look, Norel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Insert, insert. And I've got to say, there's, you know, Descript is absolutely amazing. Changed my world, Inga, when you introduced it to me. And um, and I'm really glad to say that David, who is running our tech talk at four o'clock today, has he gave me a little um snapshot of what he's running and gave me a big lesson on microphones and I too have invested in the Blue Yeti and I'm holding this up hoping that everyone can see. We can. Inga, Inga did and Anitra did and Mega did and we the four of us um, have the podcast academics talk about the chair and so throughout those six episodes we started with well Inga would we say relatively crappy sound? Oh my god <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And episode six that we just launched last week, oh, my goodness, Smiko. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And um, the beautiful, um, for those that come into the Tech Talk this afternoon, David will really give us an insight into actually what's out there and what, what um, is possible, but what's really affordable um, as well and as you build up, you build up your mm. resources um, mm -hmm. and tools of the trade. So promoting your podcast, mm. this is another aspect that um, is often forgotten about. We create, mm. we launch mm. on, goes out to Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google. Well, if it just sits there, no one's going to find it. So I'm really interested to know how you align this to being a network scholar. A lot of what you've talked about in the keynote itself and, and the topic that you unpack is, you know, we've got to think about social media, engagement, getting things out. Social media is one part. So how do we, how do you approach it? What do you think? think how do you think this through? Um, well, you first of all got to manage your expectations, right? So Buzzsprout, where we host our podcast, thank you for that tip, Narel. See, tip sharing, um, which automatically shares out to all the other directories so you don't have to go to each one separately and it, it keeps all your files together and you can do all your you know, show notes and stuff. It's really, really great platform. It also does some really nice mastering and normalises and sort of um, compensates for dodgy microphones to a large extent. But they released some statistics on podcasting. I said the average podcast listener reach is 24 people. So that's if they're the right 24 people that like you're in the kind of dash hound appreciation society and you just want to talk about dash hound clothes. I don't know. I'm just making that up. <laughs> and there's 24 other people in the world that are really into that and they're listening to podcasts. Great. But I think most of us want a bigger audience than that. There's no doubt that having Thesis Whisperer, which has over 100,000 followers on different channels, is is really powerful microphone. So our listenership, I think, sits at about a regular 700 people. So if you think about number of people who follow the blog, which is about 32,000, and I promote it in the blog every single time, that's not a really high conversion rate. So the first thing is that podcasting is a particular type of audience who likes to do particular things, like listen while they're in the kitchen, listen while they're working out, listen while they walk the dog, listen while they do the gardening. Like it's not for everyone. So who who that size of the audience segment is and how to reach them, I think. Um, so is on the reg really just purely leveraged off thesis whisperer, which is fine. Um, but academics talk about the chair uh, that we've been doing. We just finished six episodes of that. That's doing really, really well, just out of Twitter and sort of organic reach around that and academics talking to each other. But I'm working with my sister on a new um, podcast called The Tight Pod. And that one's got a bit of a struggle. So it actually was hard to get to 50 listens. I, I didn't think it would be that hard. And I thought, well, of course, because my channel isn't really built for typography nerds. 
So now we're really having an active conversation inside the team about identifying design journalists because there's still a lot of design magazines. It's a really visual profession and they still talk to each other and share podcasts. So getting in touch with journalists in the field is one strategy. You know, finding out who the influencers are in the field is another strategy. You should subscribe and listen to Buzzcast, which is the Buzzsprout um, podcast about podcasting. One of the ongoing obsessions that Buzzcast have is how to market your podcast. And one of their techniques that they talked about last week, I think, was about TikTok, which I'd never really thought about before. So now I'm really thinking about TikTok as an avenue for um, promoting podcasts, partly because it works differently to other social networks. It doesn't rely on an existing follower base. It'll randomly show your video to people and it's based on how people like and appreciate it. And the visual sound bites that you generate um, to promote a podcast, which is just an MP or file really that's got some images and um, subtitles and so on. Actually, it's a very easy piece of content for TikTok, um, except that I don't really want to put TikTok on my phone. So I'm just going through that whole process right now. I was thinking about how do we promote um, type pod on TikTok because it's a visual medium um, and type is visual. So I think it's going to depend on what your podcast is. What do you reckon, Jason? Did you have anything else to add? I just wanted to kind of circle back to the mm. idea of context collapse. Um, mm. I, I post to LinkedIn, so the social media stuff, I post to LinkedIn in a particular voice about this. Again, thinking to myself about who I think our audience is and what they would like to see and that particular bent on that particular piece of social media. I, I'll also like link in a much more happy, carefree, easygoing way uh, on Twitter and, and that sort of stuff. But but LinkedIn for me, uh, my boss uh, picks up on these all the time and then she'll she'll re, re-LinkedIn it. I'm not sure, not retweet, but for LinkedIn, like whatever yeah. that is. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm hyper aware of the fact that there are, there are people higher up in the university who pay attention to LinkedIn more than they pay attention to Twitter. Uh, and so I craft those a little bit differently because I am trying to put a particular kind of person persona onto LinkedIn. And it's not the BJJ Jeep driving, diving, you know, skydiving. More, more's the pity, Jason. More's the pity. I'm looking at the time, Narelle, and yeah. wondering if you want to wrap up. Yeah, it's uh, that's absolutely perfect. You're, you're reading my mind. I wanted mm. to say that um, all the tips that you've shared with our, um, this this session and what will be your an episode on your podcast have, has been absolutely amazing. And I think no matter um, what our experience and where we're coming from in thinking about podcasting, you've definitely provided us amazing insights. So thank you so much for revealing behind the scenes in such detail, open way. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. And it's good to get back on the podcasting horse in such a public way, Collie. Indeed it is. And Jason, well, thank you so much. And, you know, we're, we're, we threw you into the deep end. We, we booked you just before you're about to go and nothing like three days back and <laughs> we're throwing you into live podcast recording. Oh, look, I, I love it, right? Like, it's so great. It's such a great, um, it's such a great medium and such a great format. Um, and the people that we bump into as part of the podcasting stuff are such great people. And um, so thank you so much for inviting us. It, like, um, I've had a blast. Uh, it's great to meet everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah, you, Inga, thanks. as thanks. well, for dr- driving the bus. Yeah. <laughs> 